Today I'm gonna show you the perfect rig for DOS gaming, which can run any game you can think of and you don't have to spend your entire month salary on that. There are tons of choices out there you can make, all of them have pros and cons. Most of them are expensive these days, but you can certainly find some components that are dirt cheap and surprisingly good. Let's kick off with what system to choose. I've chosen Pentium 2 or 3 for slot 1 and for various reasons. Firstly, it's fast. For some games, maybe too fast, but that's gonna be taken care of. It's better to have fast CPU, you can always slow it down, but never speed up. Anything slower than Pentium could struggle with latest games. Meaning latest contemporary games regarding to DOS and its time frame, of course. And that leaves me with Socket 7, Slot 1, Socket 37A, Socket 478, Socket 775, Socket 8 and Slot A. The Slot A and Socket A motherboards were for AMD CPUs, they could be fine, however, there weren't too many motherboards with ESA slots and nowadays they are quite rare and expensive, so they're out. The Socket 7 motherboard, CPU and memory cost a little bit more than Slot 1 counterpart, also Slot 1 system is generally a bit more reliable. Then there's Socket 775, which works under DOS perfectly fine too. While the CPU is practically free, you can get a Pentium 4 or a Pentium D for a quid, the boards with ISA slots are like unicorns and if you can find one, it costs more than new teeth. It's similar for Socket 478, CPUs are free, but motherboards with ESA slots, though somewhat less unicorny, can be counted on one hand's fingers. The Socket 37A is a cracking system, however, since it's a bit newer than the slot 1, it's more difficult to find a board with ESA slots, and when you do, it's more expensive than slot 1 board. So, slot 1 it is. When choosing a motherboard, make sure it's got at least one ESA slot, you'll need it for a sound card. I prefer Intel chipset over anything else, it doesn't have to be the 440BX which is arguably the best Intel chipset for the system, but any Intel chipset will do. Wire chipsets are also fine, a bit less common and more expensive though. Be careful not to mistake this for Intel's BX chipset. This is apparently a deliberate attempt to mislead customers to buy this board. It's got nothing to do with Intel, it was made by PC chips and the chipset is called LA Aladdin and it's an absolute shite. Avoid it at all cost, this rubbish is slow and causes all sorts of problems. Same goes for this abomination, even though they're not as horrible as Aladdin, they're far cry from good. It doesn't matter how many memory slots the boards go, we're gonna use just one anyway. Or maybe two when I think about it. Some early motherboards support its 80x and 80 power supply, there's generally nothing wrong with an 80 power supply, but you may miss perks like turning on the PC with a keyboard. Moreover, you need different chassis for different power supply. Also, make sure you're not buying some industrial motherboard or something, it won't usually fit to any standard chassis except for the one it came from. Also, the power supply connector may not be compatible with ATX or AT. Let's have a look at eBay what we can find there. Yeah, let's sort it by price first. Parts only, it's useless. PC chips, it's even more useless. This one could actually be fine. This one's perfectly usable, however, if you want to connect something to LPT or Comport, it needs additional breakout cable, which is not included. And this one's pretty much the same. No ESA slot. This one could be fine too. All of these actually. So a motherboard costs somewhere between 25 and 35 pounds. If you want your quote unquote new computer to live a long life, go for a new power supply or at least properly recap the old one. It's quite important, electrolytic capacitors dry up over time and old and failing power supply can fry your motherboard and everything connected to it. If you fancy your computer quiet and the power supply is older, aside from recapping the thing, you may need to replace its fan. When you're buying a new ATX power supply, make sure it's got this 20 pin connector for a motherboard. 
PSUs nowadays have 24 pin connectors, but only some of those can be split like this. If it can't be split, you can still get an adapter for a 5 or so. And same goes for other connectors. Make sure the PSU's got PATA connectors for hard drives and CD-ROM, and this connector for 3.5 inch floppy drive, otherwise you'll need another adapter. Whatever power supply you get, make sure it's got a large fan. Choose a chassis that's made for the power supply you've chosen, is big enough for the motherboard you've chosen, and of course choose the one you fancy. I'm not gonna use any chassis for this video, I'll go this way. Since we'll be running just DOS, it really doesn't matter what CPU we get. The cheapest CPU you can find for slot 1 will suffice. Moreover, if you fancy a computer quiet, you may consider getting the slowest CPU, which doesn't need to be cooled as much as more powerful ones. They usually come with larger heating without any fans. Boxed CPUs look cracking, but they've got terrible, small, high RPM fans that can get quite noisy with time. Make sure the CPU you've chosen is supported by the motherboard, generally any Pentium 2 will be supported, Pentium 3 doesn't have to be, and in case of Celeron, it depends on its version. If the CPU is not supported, it will probably work perfectly fine, but it may not. So to avoid any problems with crashes, lockups, hangs or unwanted restarts, a CPU should be supported by a motherboard. Since any CPU for slot 1 is too fast for some early DOS games, you may experience something like this. You've got 4 options how to handle the situation. First, simply don't play the game. Second, you can buy another computer such as 386 or something that's properly slow. Third, if the BIOS allows that, you can turn off L1 and L2 cache, which is gonna slow down the CPU quite a lot. It may not be enough though, and in that case, you may try the last option and there's some piece of software that slows down the CPU for you. So, what CPU can we find on eBay, you ask? Let's have a gander. The first one's perfectly fine, so £10 it is. Memory is a bit of a problem. DOS supports up to 64MB of RAM. If you've got more, it's not a problem most of the time, but you may encounter situations where the program just refuses to work with lots of memory. Some programs have issues if you've got more than 16MB. There are a couple of workarounds though. Get one 16MB module, slap it in and you're set. However, some newer games need 32MB, so you won't be able to play them. In that case, you can buy two 16MB modules, put them both in and take one out when it's needed. It's not exactly an elegant solution, but it works. More elegant would be to use a software that limits the memory reported to the system, such as Hyman Max. It's a replacement memory manager for original Hyman provided by DOS. The Hyman Max can limit the free memory by adding max parameter. Even better solution is eat XMS utility. It does exactly what you think it does. It eats memory that you don't need or don't want to use and leaves it with the rest. There are many other utilities like this, so you can get rid of unwanted memory one way or the other. Let's have a look at how much the memory cost on eBay. Memory is very cheap, you can get pretty much any of these. If you're after two modules, it's always better to get a matching pair to avoid some problems. Now this is gonna be a bit complicated. For starters, avoid ISA card. They're slow, they've got crappy picture quality and they're expensive. Fast enough for some games, but some games will struggle and some won't work at all. AGP cards on the flip side are fast and mostly cheap, but they've got some issues and not all games can be played, depending on the card of course. PCI cards are plenty fast for pretty much any DOS game, but lots of them suffer from similar issues as AGP cards. There are, however, some PCI cards that can be used probably in any game without problems. Those would be S3 Trail 32, 
64 and S3 Verge. Even though they give these cards for free on the streets, I'd get the cards from some better manufacturers such as Number 9, cause the generic ones and some Chinese shits got usually much worse picture quality. It's almost unbelievable how some cards with the same chip can look terrible, while other cards can look good. The Trio 64 should be enough for any game you throw at it. If it can handle Quake, it can handle anything. If you don't fancy drill cards, the next best thing in terms of compatibility would be probably some AGP NVIDIA GeForce or GeForce 2 card. But as you can see, newer doesn't necessarily mean better. Some cards could cause lots of problems, like Madrox cards for instance. The cheapest ones here may or may not be actually good. But a card such as SPEA is a pretty much a safe bet. So let's add another for Inquit to our gaming rig. If you want some additional graphics functionality, you can get 3DFX Voodoo graphics or Voodoo 2. They're quite pricey nowadays and you don't need one to play games that support it. But it's a nice addition and the games look a bit different. A sound card is what we needed to noise a slot for. There are about a billion different sound cards you can choose from. The cheapest ones are usually sound cards with Vibra chipsets or Advanced Logic or CMI or something. Those are not very good, so I'd go for either ESS chipset or a sound card that's got genuine Yamaha's OPL3 chipset. In terms of FM synthesis, some prefer one, some the other, but ESS is usually cheaper.
If you want some sort of wavetable, which you should, you've got a couple of possibilities. The cheapest one, but also not a very good one, is Soundblaster R64. The sound quality is perfectly fine, but it sports terrible CQM FM synth, which is unbearable for some people. Its wavetable is also a bit rubbishy compared to a competition, unless you get extremely lucky and find a memory module for the card, which goes right here. But as these modules are rare, they're also pricey, so the crappy version will have to do. Its compatibility is also rubbish, at least in terms of general MIDI, FM synth and sounds usually work. Somewhat less crappy would be a card with ESS chipset for sounds and FM synth and QS700 or QS1000 chip on board for wavetable. The QS hasn't got the best sounding wavetable in the world, but it's probably better than the of the R64. These cards were usually cheaply made, and as such they were and are cheaply sold. You may even come across a cheap card with QS and Yamaha OPL in pair, which is a win-win. When selecting a sound card, try to get one with this type of connector. It's called Wavetable or Wave Blaster Header, and if you get a Wavetable dot on board sometime in the future, you can easily connect it to the card and you'll get probably much better Wavetable, unless the dot board is based on the QS chipset which you already have. Be careful and do not mistake a Wavetable Header for an IDE port, those are two very different things. Pretty much any sound card sports this joystick slash MIDI port. This can be used to connect either joystick or an external MIDI module, which works pretty much the same way as a wavetable daughter board. Let's search for R64 then. First one that's not broken or somehow dodgy would be this one for 35 quid. I would avoid SCSI drives. Firstly, you need an additional controller. Secondly, they are bloody noisy, especially 15,000 RPM models. And thirdly, they were probably used in some server environment running 24-7. Since motherboards for slot 1 don't have SATA controllers yet, you can get a new drive such as SSD only if you buy an additional controller for a PCI slot. You can buy some cheap Chinese shit for a couple of quid, it should be enough. Another option would be a compact flash adapter for PATA slot, which is even cheaper. Once it's in, it behaves as a normal hard drive. Either of these is fine, SSD is of course faster, but not in DOS environment, so it doesn't matter really. The advantage of getting an SATA controller is you can also connect a CD drive, but about that later on. For SATA drives, your power supply needs to have this sort of connector, if it doesn't, you'll need this adapter. If you want to go, let's say, proper retro way, you have to get an older drive. I wouldn't get drives smaller than 1GB, firstly, they are not cheap, secondly, they are always quite noisy, and thirdly, they are too small. I'd go for anything over 40GB. Sure, DOS can't use partitions larger than 2GB, and you can use only 4 of them, so even if you get 100TB drive, you can utilize only 8GB out of it. 
but larger drives are usually quieter, faster and also cheaper. Let's see what eBay offers. All of these are laptop drives, so they're useless. This one. Hitachi drives are pretty much the best you can find. This is perfect, just 10 quid. It's quite similar to the R drive. If you're gonna use an SATA controller, you can buy a new SATA drive and you can be sure it's gonna work for some time. You can even use Blu-ray drive if you've got any use for it. Again, if you wanna go full vintage, or you get TX CD or DVD drive, they're usually quite reliable and quiet. But pretty much any PATA CD or DVD drive will do. I know, I keep waffling about noise, but ponder this. Would you rather have this at home? Or this? Get any mouse and keyboard you fancy, as long as it's got a PS2 or a serial connector. USB support for DOS is very limited, nay almost non-existent, so USB mice or keyboards won't probably work as well as any other peripherals. If you want to use joystick, you have to get one for joystick port. If you want to use printer, it needs to be connected through parallel port, etc, etc. Now let's whip out a calculator and find out where we stand. Motherboard 25, CPU 10, memory 3, VGA 13, R drive 10 and sound card 35. These are eBay prices, you can probably find something even cheaper in your local secondhand shop. And that's pretty much it for the video, see you next time and cheers for all the support.